A caliphate Arabic, Khilafat Khilafa, is an Islamic state under the leadership of an Islamic steward with the title of caliph Arabic, Caliphate Khalifa, pronunciation, a person considered a religious successor to the Islamic prophet Muhammad and a leader of the entire Ummah community. Historically, the caliphates were polities based in Islam which developed into multi-ethnic trans-national empires. During the medieval period, three major caliphates succeeded each other, the Rashidun Caliphate 632 to 661, the Umayyad Caliphate 661 to 750, and the Abbasid Caliphate 750-1258. In the fourth major caliphate, the Ottoman Caliphate, the rulers of the Ottoman Empire claimed caliphal authority from 1517. During the history of Islam, a few other Muslim states, almost all hereditary monarchies, have claimed to be caliphates. Prior to the rise of Muhammad and the unification of the tribes of Arabia under Islam, Arabs followed a pre Islamic Arab polytheism, lived as self governing sedentary and nomadic communities, and often raided their neighboring tribes. Following the early Muslim conquests of the Arabian Peninsula, the region became unified and most of the tribes adopted Islam. The first caliphate, the Rashidun Caliphate, was established immediately after Muhammad's death in 632. The four Rashidun caliphs, who directly succeeded Muhammad as leaders of the Muslim community, were chosen through shura, a process of community consultation that some consider to be an early form of Islamic democracy. The fourth caliph, Ali, who, unlike the prior three, was from the same clan as Muhammad Banu Hashim, is considered by Shia Muslims to be the first rightful caliph and imam after Muhammad. Ali reigned during the first fitna 656 a civil war between supporters of Ali and supporters of the assassinated previous caliph, Uthman, from Banu Umayyah, as well as rebels in Egypt. The war led to the establishment of the Umayyad Caliphate under Muawiyah I in 661. The second caliphate, the Umayyad Caliphate, was ruled by Banu Umayyah, a Meccan clan descended from Umayyah ibn Abd Shams. The caliphate continued the Arab conquests, incorporating the Caucasus, Transoxiana, Sindh, the Maghreb and the Iberian Peninsula into the Muslim world. The caliphate had considerable acceptance of the Christians within its territory, necessitated by their large numbers, especially in the region of Syria. Following the Abbasid Revolution from 746 to 750, which primarily arose from non-Arab Muslim disenfranchisement, the Abbasid Caliphate was established in 750. The Third Caliphate, the Abbasid Caliphate was ruled by the Abbasids, a dynasty of Meccan origin which descended from Hashim, a great-grandfather of Muhammad, making them part of Banu Hashim, via Abbas, an uncle of Muhammad, hence the name. Caliph al-Mansur founded its second capital of Baghdad in 762 which became a major scientific, cultural and art center, as did the territory as a whole during a period known as the Islamic Golden Age. From the 10th century, Abbasid rule became confined to an area around Baghdad. From 945 to 1157, the Abbasid Caliphate came under Bayad and then Seljuk military control. In 1250, a non-Arab army created by the Abbasids called the Mamluks came to power in Egypt. In 1258, the Mongol Empire sacked Baghdad, ending the Abbasid Caliphate, and in 1261 the Mamluks in Egypt re-established the Abbasid Caliphate in Cairo. Though lacking in political power, the Abbasid dynasty continued to claim authority in religious matters until the Ottoman conquest of Mamluk Egypt in 1517. The fourth major caliphate, the Ottoman Caliphate, was established after their conquest of Mamluk Egypt in 1517. The conquest gave the Ottomans control over the holy cities of Mecca and Medina, previously controlled by the Mamluks. The Ottomans gradually came to be viewed as the de facto leaders and representatives of the Muslim world. Following their defeat in World War I, their empire was partitioned by the United Kingdom and French Third Republic, and on 3 March 1924, the first president of the Turkish Republic, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, as part of his reforms, constitutionally abolished the institution of the caliphate. A few other states that existed through history have called themselves caliphates, including the Ismaili Fatimid Caliphate in northeast Africa the Umayyad Caliphate of Cordoba in Iberia the Berber Almohad Caliphate in Morocco and the Fuller Sokoto Caliphate in present-day northern Nigeria 1804 
The Sunni branch of Islam stipulates that, as a head of state, a caliph may come to power in one of four ways, either through an election, through nomination, through a selection by a committee, or by force. Followers of Shia Islam, however, believe a caliph should be an imam chosen by God from the Ahl al-Bayt the family of the house, referring to Muhammad's family. In the early 21st century, following the failure of the Arab Spring and defeat of the self-proclaimed Islamic State, there has seen a broad mainstream embrace of a collective Muslim identity by young Muslims and the appeal of a caliphate as a idealized future Muslim state has grown ever stronger. Etymology <inaudible> 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 Before the advent of Islam, Arabian monarchs traditionally used the title Malik king, ruler, or another from the same root. The term caliph derives from the Arabic word khalifa, caliph pronunciation, which means successor, steward, or deputy, and has traditionally been considered a shortening of caliphate rasul Allah, successor of the messenger of God. However, studies of pre-Islamic texts suggest that the original meaning of the phrase was Successor selected by God. Topic: <inaudible> Rashidun Caliphate, 632 to 661. Topic: <inaudible> Succession to Muhammad. Shortly before his death, Muhammad called all the Muslims who had accompanied him on the final Hajj pilgrimage to gather around at a place known as Ghadir Qum. Muhammad gave a long sermon, part of which states, O people! Reflect on the Quran and comprehend its verses. Look into its clear verses and do not follow its ambiguous parts, for by Allah, none shall be able to explain to you its warnings and its mysteries, nor shall anyone clarify its interpretation, other than the one that I have grasped his hand, brought up beside myself, and lifted his arm, the one about whom I inform you that whomever I am his mawler, this Ali is his mawler, and he is Ali ibn Abi Talib, my brother, the executor of my will, Washi, whose appointment as your guardian and leader has been sent down to me from Allah, the mighty and the majestic. This event has been narrated by both Shia and Sunni sources. In Medina, after the farewell pilgrimage and the event of Ghadir Qum, Muhammad ordered an army under the command of Osama bin Zayd. He commanded all the companions, except for his family, to go with Osama to Syria to avenge the Muslims' defeat at the Battle of Muta. Muhammad gave Osama the banner of Islam on the 18th day of the Islamic month of Safar in the year 11 AH. Abu Bakr and Umar were among those that Muhammad commanded to join Osama's army, however, Abu Bakr and Umar resisted going under the command of Osama because they thought that he, who was 18 or 20 at the time, was too young to lead an army, despite Muhammad's teachings that age and standing in society did not necessarily correspond to being a good general. In response to these worries, the Prophet said, O oh Arabs! You are miserable because I have appointed Osama as your general, and you are raising questions if he is qualified to lead you in war. I know you are the same people who had raised the same question about his father. By God, Osama is qualified to be your general just as his father was qualified to be a general. Now obey his orders and go. Whenever Muhammad felt any relief from his fatal sickness, he would inquire as to whether Osama's army had left for Syria yet, and would continue urging his companions to leave for Syria. Muhammad even said, "'Asama's army must leave at once. May Allah curse those men who do not go with him.'" However, while a few companions were ready to join Osama's army, many other companions, including Abu Bakr and Umar, disobeyed Muhammad's orders. It is also noted that this was the only battle expedition where Muhammad urged his companions to go the battle no matter what. For other battles, if someone was unable to go to the fight, Muhammad would let them stay at home. It has been pointed out in history that the fact that Muhammad ordered his companions, but not his family, to leave Medina right before he knew he was about to die is proof that he did not intend for his companions to decide on his succession. This has served as an indication that, as Muhammad did not want his companions to be in Medina when he died, he did not want his companions to decide among themselves who would be his successor. That matter had already been decided at Ghadir Qum. 
However, after Muhammad passed away, a group of Muslims left Ali and gathered at Saqifa. In what has been described as a coup d'état, Umar pledged allegiance to Abu Bakr, after which Abu Bakr assumed power. This was followed by an attack on the house of Ali and Fatima in an attempt to defeat any opposition to Abu Bakr. Topic: <laughs> Rashidun Caliphs. Abu Bakr, the first successor of Muhammad, nominated Umar as his successor on his deathbed. Umar, the second caliph, was killed by a Persian named Peruz Nayavandi. His successor, Uthman, was elected by a council of electors Majlis. Uthman was killed by members of a disaffected group. Ali then took control but was not universally accepted as caliph by the governors of Egypt and later by some of his own guard. He faced two major rebellions and was assassinated by Abd al-Rahman ibn Muljam, a kawaray. Ali's tumultuous rule lasted only five years. This period is known as the Fitna, or the First Islamic Civil War. The followers of Ali later became the Shia Shirat Ali. Partisans of Ali, minority sect of Islam and reject the legitimacy of the first three caliphs. The followers of all four Rashidun caliphs Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman and Ali became the majority Sunni sect. Under the Rashidun each region sultanate, wilaya, or emirate of the caliphate had its own governor sultan, wali or emir. Muawiyah, a relative of Uthman and governor wali of Syria, succeeded Ali as caliph. Muawiyah transformed the caliphate into a hereditary office, thus founding the Umayyad dynasty. In areas which were previously under Sasanian Empire or Byzantine rule, the caliphs lowered taxes, provided greater local autonomy to their delegated governors, greater religious freedom for Jews, and some indigenous Christians, and brought peace to peoples demoralized and disaffected by the casualties and heavy taxation that resulted from the decades of Byzantine-Persian warfare. Topic. Ali's Caliphate and the rise of the Umayyad dynasty Ali's reign was plagued by turmoil and internal strife. The Persians, taking advantage of this, infiltrated the two armies and attacked the other army causing chaos and internal hatred between the companions at the Battle of Siphon. The battle lasted several months, resulting in a stalemate. In order to avoid further bloodshed, Ali agreed to negotiate with Muawiyah. This caused a faction of approximately 4,000 people, who would come to be known as the Karihites, to abandon the fight. After defeating the Karihites at the Battle of Narawan, Ali was later assassinated by the Karihite ibn Muljam. Ali's son Hassan was elected as the next caliph, but handed his title to Muawiyah a few months later. Muawiyah became the fifth or second by Shia reckoning caliph, establishing the Umayyad dynasty, named after the great-grandfather of Uthman and Muawiyah, Umayyah ibn Abd Shams. Topic: <laughs> Umayyad Caliphate 661 to 750. Beginning with the Umayyads, the title of the caliph became hereditary. Under the Umayyads, the caliphate grew rapidly in territory, incorporating the Caucasus, Transoxiana, Sindh, the Maghreb and most of the Iberian Peninsula into the Muslim world. At its greatest extent, the Umayyad Caliphate covered 5.17 million square miles 13,400,000 square kilometers, making it the largest empire the world had yet seen and the sixth largest ever to exist in history. Geographically, the empire was divided into several provinces, the borders of which changed numerous times during the Umayyad reign. Each province had a governor appointed by the caliph. However, for a variety of reasons, including that they were not elected by shura and suggestions of impious behavior, the Umayyad dynasty was not universally supported within the Muslim community. Some supported prominent early Muslims like al-Zabair, others felt that only members of Muhammad's clan, the Banu Hashim, or his own lineage, the descendants of Ali, should rule. There were numerous rebellions against the Umayyads, as well as splits within the Umayyad ranks, notably, the rivalry between Yaman and Qais. At the command of Yazid son of Muawiyah, an army led by Umar ibn Sa'd, a commander by the name of Shimma ibn Thil Jorshan killed Ali's son Hussein and his family at the Battle of Kabbalah in 680, solidifying the Shia-Sunni split. 
Eventually, supporters of the Banu Hashim and the supporters of the lineage of Ali united to bring down the Umayyads in 750. However, the Shi'a Ali, the party of Ali, were again disappointed when the Abbasid dynasty took power, as the Abbasids were descended from Muhammad's uncle Abbas ibn Abd al-Muttalib and not from Ali. Topic: <laughs> Abbasid Caliphate 750-1258-1261-1517. Topic: Abbasid Caliphs at Baghdad. In 750, the Umayyad dynasty was overthrown by another family of Meccan origin, the Abbasids. Their time represented a scientific, cultural, and religious flowering. Islamic art and music also flourished significantly during their reign. Their major city and capital, Baghdad, began to flourish as a center of knowledge, culture, and trade. This period of cultural fruition ended in 1258 with the sack of Baghdad by the Mongols under Hulagu Khan. The Abbasid Caliphate had however lost its effective power outside Iraq already by c. 920. By 945, the loss of power became official when the Bayids conquered Baghdad and all of Iraq. The empire fell apart and its parts were ruled for the next century by local dynasties. In the 9th century, the Abbasids created an army loyal only to their caliphate, composed predominantly of Turkic Cuman, Circassian, and Georgian slave origin known as Mamluks. By 1250, the Mamluks came to power in Egypt. The Mamluk army, though often viewed negatively, both helped and hurt the caliphate. Early on, it provided the government with a stable force to address domestic and foreign problems. However, creation of this foreign army and al mutajim's transfer of the capital from Baghdad to Samarra created a division between the caliphate and the peoples they claimed to rule. In addition, the power of the Mamluks steadily grew until ar Radi was constrained to hand over most of the royal functions to Muhammad ibn Raiq. Under the Mamluk Sultanate of Cairo 1261 In 1261, following the Mongol conquest of Baghdad, the Mamluk rulers of Egypt tried to gain legitimacy for their rule by declaring the re-establishment of the Abbasid Caliphate in Cairo. The Abbasid caliphs in Egypt had little political power, they continued to maintain the symbols of authority, but their sway was confined to religious matters. The first Abbasid Caliph of Cairo was al Mustansir. R. June to November 1261. The Abbasid Caliphate of Cairo lasted until the time of al Mutawakkil III, who ruled as Caliph from 1508 to 1516, then he was deposed briefly in 1516 by his predecessor al Mustamshik, but was restored again to the Caliphate in 1517. The Ottoman great Sultan Selim I defeated the Mamluk Sultanate and made Egypt part of the Ottoman Empire in 1517. Al Mutawakkil III was captured together with his family and transported to Constantinople as a prisoner where he had a ceremonial role. He died in 1543, following his return to Cairo. <laughs> Parallel caliphates to the Abbasids The Abbasid dynasty lost effective power over much of the Muslim realm by the first half of the 10th century. Shi'a Ubaid Allah al Mahdi Billa of the Fatimid dynasty, who claimed descent from Muhammad through his daughter, claimed the title of caliph in 909, creating a separate line of caliphs in North Africa. Initially controlling Algeria, Tunisia, and Libya, the Fatimid caliphs extended their rule for the next 150 years, taking Egypt and Palestine, before the Abbasid dynasty was able to turn the tide, limiting Fatimid rule to Egypt. The Fatimid dynasty finally ended in 1171. The Umayyad dynasty, which had survived and come to rule over al Andalus, reclaimed the title of caliph in 929, lasting until it was overthrown in 1031. Topic: Fatimid Caliphate 909 
The Fatimid Caliphate was an Ismaili Shi'i caliphate, originally based in Tunisia, that extended its rule across the Mediterranean coast of Africa and ultimately made Egypt the center of its caliphate. At its height, in addition to Egypt, the caliphate included varying areas of the Maghreb, Sicily, the Levant and the Hejaz. The Fatimids established the Tunisian city of Mardia and made it their capital city, before conquering Egypt and building the city of Cairo there in 969. Thereafter, Cairo became the capital of the caliphate, with Egypt becoming the political, cultural and religious center of the state. Islam scholar Louis Massignon dubbed the 4th century R, 10th century CE as the Ismaili century in the history of Islam. The term Fatimite is sometimes used to refer to the citizens of this caliphate. The ruling elite of the state belonged to the Ismaili branch of Shi'im. The leaders of the dynasty were Ismaili imams and had a religious significance to Ismaili Muslims. They are also part of the chain of holders of the office of the caliphate, as recognized by some Muslims. Therefore, this constitutes a rare period in history in which the descendants of Ali hence the name Fatimid, referring to Ali's wife Fatima and the caliphate were united to any degree, excepting the final period of the Rashidun caliphate under Ali himself, the caliphate was reputed to exercise a degree of religious tolerance towards non-Ismaili sects of Islam as well as towards Jews, Maltese Christians and Copts. Umayyad Caliphate of Cordoba During the Umayyad dynasty, the Iberian Peninsula was an integral province of the Umayyad Caliphate ruling from Damascus. The Umayyads lost the position of caliph in Damascus in 750, and Abd al-Rahman I became emir of Cordoba in 756 after six years in exile. Intent on regaining power, he defeated the existing Islamic rulers of the area who defied Umayyad rule and united various local fiefdoms into an emirate. Rulers of the emirate used the title, Emir, or Sultan, until the 10th century, when Abd al Rahman III was faced with the threat of invasion by the Fatimid Caliphate. To aid his fight against the invading Fatimids, who claimed the caliphate in opposition to the generally recognized Abbasid Caliph of Baghdad, al-Mutadid, Abd al-Rahman III claimed the title of caliph himself. This helped Abd al-Rahman III gain prestige with his subjects, and the title was retained after the Fatimids were repulsed. The rule of the caliphate is considered as the heyday of Muslim presence in the Iberian Peninsula, before it fragmented into various taifas in the 11th century. This period was characterized by a flourishing in technology, trade and culture. Many of the buildings of Al-Andalus were constructed in this period. Topic: <laughs> Almohad Caliphate 1147 to 1269. The Almohad Caliphate, Berber languages, Imwadan, from Arabic Almhedon Al-Muwahidun, the monotheists, or the Unifiers was a Moroccan Berber Muslim movement founded in the 12th century. The Almohad movement was started by Ibn Tumart among the Masmuda tribes of southern Morocco. The Almohads first established a Berber state in Tinmel in the Atlas Mountains in roughly 1120. The Almohads succeeded in overthrowing the Almoravid dynasty in governing Morocco by 1147, when Abd al Mutmin conquered Marrakesh and declared himself caliph. They then extended their power over all of the Maghreb by 1159. Al Andalus followed the fate of Africa and all Islamic Iberia was under Almohad rule by 1172. The Almohad dominance of Iberia continued until 1212, when Muhammad al Nazir was defeated at the Battle of Las Navas de Tolosa in the Sierra Morena by an alliance of the Christian princes of Castile, Aragon, Navarre, and Portugal. Nearly all of the Moorish dominions in Iberia were lost soon after, with the great Moorish cities of Cordoba and Seville falling to the Christians in 1236 and 1248, respectively. The Almohads continued to rule in northern Africa until the piecemeal loss of territory through the revolt of tribes and districts enabled the rise of their most effective enemies, the Marinid dynasty, in 1215. The last representative of the line, Idris al Wathiq, was reduced to the possession of Marrakesh, where he was murdered by a slave in 1269. The Marinids seized Marrakesh, ending the Almohad domination of the Western Maghreb. Almohad 
Topic: Ottoman Caliphate 1517 to 1924. The caliphate was claimed by the sultans of the Ottoman Empire beginning with Murad I reigned 1362-1389, while recognizing no authority on the part of the Abbasid caliphs of the Mamluk ruled Cairo. Hence the seat of the caliphate moved to the Ottoman capital of Edirne. In 1453, after Mehmed the Conqueror's conquest of Constantinople, the seat of the Ottomans moved to Constantinople, present-day Istanbul. In 1517, the Ottoman Sultan Selim I defeated and annexed the Mamluk Sultanate of Cairo into his empire. Through conquering and unifying Muslim lands, Selim I became the defender of the holy cities of Mecca and Medina, which further strengthened the Ottoman claim to the caliphate in the Muslim world. Ottomans gradually came to be viewed as the de facto leaders and representatives of the Islamic world. However, the earlier Ottoman caliphs did not officially bear the title of caliph in their documents of state, inscriptions, or coinage. It was only in the late 18th century that the claim to the caliphate was discovered by the sultans to have a practical use, since it allowed them to counter Russian claims to protect Ottoman Christians with their own claim to protect Muslims under Russian rule. According to Barthold, the first time the title of caliph was used as a political instead of symbolic religious title by the Ottomans was the Treaty of Kukuk Kainaka with the Russian Empire in 1774, when the empire retained moral authority on territory whose sovereignty was ceded to the Russian Empire. The British supported and propagated the view that the Ottomans were caliphs of Islam among Muslims in British India, and the Ottoman sultans helped the British by issuing pronouncements to the Muslims of India telling them to support British rule from Sultan Ali III and Sultan Abdumsid I. The outcome of the Russo-Turkish War of 1768–74 was disastrous for the Ottomans. Large territories, including those with large Muslim populations, such as Crimea, were lost to the Russian Empire. However, the Ottomans under Abdul Hamid I claimed a diplomatic victory by being allowed to remain the religious leaders of Muslims in the now independent Crimea as part of the peace treaty. In return, Russia became the official protector of Christians in Ottoman territory. Around 1880, Sultan Abdul Hamid II reasserted the title as a way of countering Russian expansion into Muslim lands. His claim was most fervently accepted by the Muslims of British India. By the eve of World War I, the Ottoman state, despite its weakness relative to Europe, represented the largest and most powerful independent Islamic political entity. The Sultan also enjoyed some authority beyond the borders of his shrinking empire as Caliph of Muslims in Egypt, India, and Central Asia. In 1899, John Hay, U.S. Secretary of State, asked the American ambassador to Ottoman Turkey, Oscar Strauss, to approach Sultan Abdul Hamid II to use his position as Caliph to order the Taushug people of the Sultanate of Sulu in the Philippines to submit to American suzerainty and American military rule. The Sultan obliged them and wrote the letter which was sent to Sulu via Mecca. As a result, the Sulu Muhammadans refused to join the insurrectionists and had placed themselves under the control of our army, thereby recognizing American sovereignty. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Abolition of the Caliphate 1924. After the armistice of Mudros of October 1918 with the military occupation of Constantinople and Treaty of Versailles 1919, the position of the Ottomans was uncertain. The movement to protect or restore the Ottomans gained force after the Treaty of Sevres August 1920 which imposed the partitioning of the Ottoman Empire and gave Greece a powerful position in Anatolia, to the distress of the Turks. They called for help and the movement was the result. The movement had collapsed by late 1922. On 3 March 1924, the first president of the Turkish Republic, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, as part of his reforms, constitutionally abolished the institution of the caliphate. Its powers within Turkey were transferred to the Grand National Assembly of Turkey, the parliament of the newly formed Turkish Republic. The title was then claimed by Hussein bin Ali, Sharif of Mecca and Hejaz, leader of the Arab Revolt, but his kingdom was defeated and annexed by Ibn Sa'd in 1925. A summit was convened at Cairo in 1926 to discuss the revival of the caliphate, but most Muslim countries did not participate and no action was taken to implement the summit's resolutions. 
Though the title Amir al muminin was adopted by the King of Morocco and by Muhammad Omar, former head of the Taliban of Afghanistan, neither claimed any legal standing or authority over Muslims outside the borders of their respective countries. Since the end of the Ottoman Empire, occasional demonstrations have been held calling for the re-establishment of the Caliphate. Organizations which call for the re-establishment of the Caliphate include Hesput Tahir and the Muslim Brotherhood. Topic: <laughs> Parallel Caliphates to the Ottomans. Topic: <laughs> Yogyakarta Caliphate (1755–2015). The Indonesian Sultan of Yogyakarta historically used Khalifatullah Caliph of God) as one of his many titles. In 2015, Sultan Hamengkubuwono X renounced any claim to the Caliphate in order to facilitate his daughter's inheritance of the throne, as the theological opinion of the time was that a woman may hold the secular office of Sultan but not the spiritual office of Caliph. Topic: <laughs> Sokoto Caliphate (1804–1903). The Sokoto Caliphate was an Islamic state in what is now Nigeria led by Usman Dan Fodio. Founded during the Fulani War in the early 19th century, it controlled one of the most powerful empires in sub-Saharan Africa prior to European conquest and colonization. The Caliphate remained extant through the colonial period and afterwards, though with reduced power. The current head of the Sokoto Caliphate is Saradu Abu Bakar. Topic: Khilafat Movement 1919 to 24. The Khilafat Movement was launched by Muslims in British India in 1920 to defend the Ottoman Caliphate at the end of the First World War, and it spread throughout the British colonial territories. It was strong in British India, where it formed a rallying point for some Indian Muslims as one of many anti-British Indian political movements. Its leaders included Muhammad Ali Juhar, his brother Shawkat Ali and Maulana Abul Kalam Azad, Dr. Mukhtar Ahmed Ansari, Hakim Ajmal Khan and barrister Muhammad Jan Abbasi. For a time it was supported by Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, who was a member of the Central Khilafat Committee. However, the movement lost its momentum after the abolition of the Caliphate in 1924. After further arrests and flight of its leaders, and a series of offshoots splintered off from the main organization, the movement eventually died down and disbanded. <laughs> Sharifian Caliphate The Sharifian Caliphate Arabic, Klaf Shravit was an Arab caliphate proclaimed by the Sharifian rulers of Hejaz in 1924, in lieu of the Ottoman Caliphate. The idea of the Sharifian Caliphate had been floating around since at least the 15th century. Toward the end of the 19th century, it started to gain importance due to the decline of the Ottoman Empire, which was heavily defeated in the Russo-Turkish War of 1877–78. There is little evidence, however, that the idea of a Sharifian caliphate ever gained wide grassroots support in the Middle East or anywhere else for that matter. Non-political caliphates Though non-political, some Sufi orders and the Ahmadiyya movement define themselves as caliphates. Their leaders are thus commonly referred to as caliphs Sufi caliphates In Sufism, tariqas orders are led by spiritual leaders Ruania, the main caliphs, who nominate local caliphs to organize zawas. Sufi caliphates are not necessarily hereditary. Caliphs are aimed to serve the silsila in relation to spiritual responsibilities and to propagate the teachings of the tariqa. Ahmadiyya Caliphate 1908 present 
The Ahmadiyya Muslim community is an Islamic revivalist movement founded in 1889 by Mirza Ghulam Ahmad of Qadian, India, who claimed to be the promised Messiah and Mahdi, awaited by Muslims. He also claimed to be a follower prophet subordinate to Muhammad the Prophet of Islam. After his death in 1908, his first successor, Hakim Nur ud Din became the caliph of the community and assumed the title of Khalifatul Masi successor or caliph of the Messiah. Ahmadi Muslims believe that the Ahmadiyya Caliphate established after the passing of the community's founder is the re-establishment of the Rashidun Caliphate. The Ahmadiyya Caliphate has spanned over a century, seen five caliphs and continues to operate under this structure, with the caliph having overall authority for all religious and organizational matters. According to Ahmadiyya thought, it is not essential for a caliph to be the head of a state, rather the religious and organizational significance of the caliphate is emphasized. It is above all a religious office, with the purpose to uphold, strengthen and spread Islam and maintain the high moral standards within the Muslim community established by Muhammad, who was not merely a political leader but primarily a religious leader. The caliphate is understood as a system dealing with the organization of believers and relating to the administration of the Muslim community whether or not it involves a governmental role. Being based on the precepts of prophethood, the institution of caliphate can therefore, like prophethood, exist and flourish without a state. If a caliph does happen to bear governmental authority as a head of state, it is incidental and subsidiary in relation to his overall function as caliph which is applicable to believers transnationally and not limited to one particular state or political entity. The system of caliphate in Islam, thus understood, transcends national sovereignty and ethnic divide, forming a universal supra-national entity. According to Ahmadi Muslims, the caliphate seeks to establish God's authority on earth and the caliph strives to uphold that authority within the community of followers. It is required that the caliph carry out his duties through consultation and taking into consideration the views of the members of the Majlis Ash-Shura consultative body. However, it is not incumbent upon him to always accept the views and recommendations of the members. The caliph has overall authority for all religious and organizational matters and is bound to decide and act in accordance with the Quran and Sunnah. After Hakim Nur ud Din, the first caliph, the title of the Ahmadiyya Caliph continued under Mirza Mahmud Ahmad, who led the community for over 50 years. Following him were Mirza Nazir Ahmad and then Mirza Tahir Ahmad, who were the third and fourth caliphs respectively. The current caliph is Mirza Masroor Ahmad, who lives in London with a following of 10 to 20 million in over 200 countries and territories of the world. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Religious basis. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Quran. The Quran uses the term Khalifa twice. First, in Al-Baqarah, 30, it refers to God creating humanity as his Khalifa on earth. Second, in Sad, 26, it addresses King David as God's Khalifa and reminds him of his obligation to rule with justice. In addition, the following excerpt from the Quran, known as the Easterclaf verse, is used by some to argue for a Quranic basis for caliphate. God has promised those of you who have attained to faith and do righteous deeds that, of a certainty, he will make them Khalifa on earth, even as he caused some of those who lived before them to become Khalifa, and that, of a certainty, he will firmly establish for them the religion which he has been pleased to bestow on them, and that, of a certainty, he will cause their erstwhile state of fear to be replaced by a sense of security seeing that they worship me alone, not ascribing divine powers to aught beside me. But all who, after having understood this, choose to deny the truth, it is they, they who are truly iniquitous, and nur. 55. In the above verse, the word khalifa, the plural of khalifa has been variously translated as successes and ones who accede to power. Several schools of jurisprudence and thought within Sunni Islam argue that to govern a state by sharia is, by definition, to rule via the caliphate and use the following verses to sustain their claim. So govern between the people by that which God has revealed Islam, and follow not their vain desires, beware of them in case they seduce you from just some part of that which God has revealed to you. O you who believe! Obey God, and obey the Messenger and then those among you who are in authority, and if you have a dispute concerning any matter, refer it to God and the Messenger's rulings, if you are in truth believers in God and the last day. 
that is better and more seemly in the end. Topic: <laughs> Hadith. The following hadith from Musnad Ahmad ibn Hanbal can be understood to prophesy two eras of caliphate, both on the lines precepts of prophethood. Hadrat Huzaifa narrated that the Messenger of Allah said, Prophethood will remain among you as long as Allah wills. Then Caliphate on the lines of Prophethood shall commence, and remain as long as Allah wills. Then corrupt, erosive monarchy would take place, and it will remain as long as Allah wills. After that, despotic kingship would emerge, and it will remain as long as Allah wills. Then, the Caliphate shall come once again based on the precept of Prophethood. In the above, the first era of caliphate is commonly accepted by Muslims to be that of the Rashidun Caliphate. Nafia reported saying, It has been reported on the authority of Nafi, that Abdullah b. Umar paid a visit to Abdullah b. Muti in the days when atrocities were perpetrated on the people of Medina at Hara in the time of Yazid b. Muawiyah. Ibn Muti said, place a pillow for Abu Abd al-Rahman family name of Abdullah b. Umar. But the latter said, I have not come to sit with you. I have come to you to tell you a tradition I heard from the Messenger of Allah. I heard him say, one who withdraws his band from obedience to the Emir will find no argument in his defense when he stands before Allah on the Day of Judgment, and one who dies without having bound himself by an oath of allegiance to an Emir will die the death of one belonging to the days of Jahiliya, Sahih Muslim, Book 020, Hadith 4562. Hisham ibn Urwa reported on the authority of Abu Salah on the authority of Abu Hurairah that Muhammad said, Leaders will take charge of you after me, where the pious one will lead you with his piety and the impious one with his impiety, so only listen to them and obey them in everything which conforms with the truth Islam. If they act rightly it is for your credit, and if they acted wrongly it is counted for you and against them. Muslim narrated on the authority of Al-Ayraj, on the authority of Abu Hurairah, that Muhammad said, Behold, the Imam Caliph is but a shield from behind whom the people fight and by whom they defend themselves. Muslim reported on the authority of Abdul Aziz al-Mukran, who said, I accompanied Abu Hurairah for five years and heard him talking of Muhammad saying, The prophets ruled over the children of Israel, whenever a prophet died another prophet succeeded him, but there will be no prophet after me. There will be caliphs and they will number many. They asked, What then do you order us? He said, Fulfill the bayah transaction, sale to them one after the other and give them their due. Surely God will ask them about what he entrusted them with. Prophesied Caliphate of the Mahdi Many Islamic texts, including several ahadith, state that the Mahdi will be elected caliph and rule over a caliphate. A number of Islamic figures titled themselves both Caliph and Al Mahdi, including the first Abbasid caliph as Safa. Topic: The Sahaba of Muhammad. Al-Habab ibn al-Munthir said, when the Sahaba met in the wake of the death of Muhammad, at the Thaqifah Hall of Bani Sarida, let there be one emir from us and one emir from you meaning one from the Ansar and one from the Mohajirin. Upon this Abu Bakr replied, it is forbidden for Muslims to have two emirs rulers. Then he got up and addressed the Muslims. It has additionally been reported that Abu Bakr went on to say on the day of al saqifah it is forbidden for Muslims to have two emirs for this would cause differences in their affairs and concepts, their unity would be divided and disputes would break out amongst them. The sunnah would then be abandoned, the bid'ah innovations would spread and fitna would grow, and that is in no one's interests. The Sahaba agreed to this and selected Abu Bakr as their first caliph. Habab ibn Mundir who suggested the idea of two emirs corrected himself and was the first to give Abu Bakr the bayah. This indicates an IJMA as Sahaba of all of the Sahaba. Ali ibn i Abi Talib, who was attending the body of Muhammad at the time, also consented to this. Imam Ali whom the Shia revere said, people must have an emir.
where the believer works under his Amara rule and under which the unbeliever would also benefit, until his rule ended by the end of his life Agile, the booty would be gathered, the enemy would be fought, the roots would be made safe, the strong one will return what he took from the weak till the tyrant would be contained, and not bother anyone. Topic. Views of Islamic theologians Scholars like al Mawadi, Ibn Hazm, Ahmad al Kalkashandi, and al Shah Rani stated that the global Muslim community can have only one leader at any given time. Al Nawawi and Abd al Jabbar ibn Ahmad declared it impermissible to give oaths of loyalty to more than one leader. Al Joziri said, The Imams scholars of the four schools of thought may Allah have mercy on them agree that the caliphate is an obligation, and that the Muslims must appoint a leader who would implement the injunctions of the religion, and give the oppressed justice against the oppressors. It is forbidden for Muslims to have two leaders in the world whether in agreement or discord. Shia scholars have expressed similar opinions. However, the Shia school of thought states that the leader must not be appointed by the Islamic Ummah, but must be appointed by God. al kurtubi said that the Caliph is the pillar upon which other pillars rest, and said of the Quranic verse, Indeed, man is made upon this earth a Caliph. This ayah is a source in the selection of an imam, and a caliph, he is listened to and he is obeyed, for the word is united through him, and the arkham laws of the caliph are implemented through him, and there is no difference regarding the obligation of that between the ummah. And Nawawi said sad face, the scholars consented that it is an obligation upon the Muslims to select a caliph. Al-Ghazali when writing of the potential consequences of losing the caliphate said, the judges will be suspended, the wilayat provinces will be nullified, the decrees of those in authority will not be executed and all the people will be on the verge of haram. Ibn Taymiyyah said, it is obligatory to know that the office in charge of commanding over the people i.e., the post of the khalifa is one of the greatest obligations of the deen. In fact, there is no establishment of the deen except by it. This is the opinion of the Salaf, such as al fudail ibn Ayyad, Ahmad ibn Hanbal and others. Topic. Period of dormancy Once the subject of intense conflict and rivalry amongst Muslim rulers, the caliphate lay dormant and largely unclaimed since the 1920s. For the vast majority of Muslims the caliph as leader of the Ummah is cherished both as memory and ideal", as a time when Muslims "...enjoyed scientific and military superiority globally". The Islamic prophet Muhammad is reported to have prophesied, Prophethood will remain with you for as long as Allah wills it to remain, then Allah will raise it up whenever He wills to raise it up. Afterwards, there will be a caliphate that follows the guidance of prophethood remaining with you for as long as Allah wills it to remain. Then, he will raise it up whenever he wills to raise it up. Afterwards, there will be a reign of violently oppressive rule and it will remain with you for as long as Allah wills it to remain. Then, there will be a reign of tyrannical rule and it will remain for as long as Allah wills it to remain. Then, Allah will raise it up whenever he wills to raise it up. Then, there will be a caliphate that follows the guidance of prophethood. Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant 2014 -present. The group Tanzim Qaidat al-Jihad fi Bilad al-Rafidain al in Iraq formed as an affiliate of al-Qaeda network of Islamist militants during the Iraq War. The group eventually expanded into Syria and rose to prominence as the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant ISIL during the Syrian Civil War. In the summer of 2014, the group launched the Northern Iraq Offensive, seizing the city of Mosul. The group declared itself a caliphate under Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi on 29 June 2014 and renamed itself as the ''Islamic State''. ISIL's claim to be the highest authority of Muslims has been widely rejected. 
No prominent Muslim scholar has supported its declaration of caliphate, even Salafi jihadist preachers accused the group of engaging in political showmanship and bringing disrepute to the notion of Islamic State. ISIL has been at war with armed forces including the Iraqi Army, the Syrian Army, the Free Syrian Army, Al Nusra Front, Syrian Democratic Forces, and Iraqi Kurdistan's Peshmerga and People's Protection Units YPG, along with a 60 nation coalition in its efforts to establish a de facto state on Iraqi and Syrian. Syrian territory. Topic: <inaudible> Ahmadiyya view. The members of the Ahmadiyya community believe that the Ahmadiyya Caliphate (Arabic: Khilafa) is the continuation of the Islamic Caliphate, first being the Rashidun, rightly guided Caliphate of righteous caliphs. This is believed to have been suspended with Ali, the son-in-law of Muhammad and re-established with the appearance of Mirza Ghulam Ahmad the founder of the movement whom Ahmadis identify as the promised Messiah and Mahdi. Ahmadis maintain that in accordance with Quranic verses such as Quran and numerous ahadith on the issue, Khilafah can only be established by God himself and is a divine blessing given to those who believe and work righteousness and uphold the unity of God, therefore any movement to establish the Khilafah centered on human endeavors alone is bound to fail, particularly when the condition of the people diverges from the precepts of prophethood and they are as a result disunited, their inability to establish a Khilafah caused fundamentally by by the lack of righteousness in them. Although the Khalifa is elected it is believed that God himself directs the hearts of believers towards an individual. Thus the Khalifa is designated neither necessarily by right i.e. the rightful or competent one in the eyes of the people at that time nor merely by election but primarily by God. According to Ahmadiyya thought, a Khalifa need not be the head of a state, rather the Ahmadiyya community emphasizes the spiritual and organizational significance of the Khilafah. It is primarily a religious, spiritual office, with the purpose of upholding, strengthening and spreading Islam and of maintaining the high spiritual and moral standards within the global community established by Muhammad, who was not merely a political leader but primarily a religious leader. If a Khalifa does happen to bear governmental authority as a head of state, it is incidental and subsidiary in relation to his overall function as Khalifa which is applicable to believers transnationally and not limited to one particular state. Ahmadi Muslims believe that God has assured them that this caliphate will endure to the end of time, depending on their righteousness and faith in God. The Khalifa provides unity, security, moral direction and progress for the community. It is required that the Khalifa carry out his duties through consultation and taking into consideration the views of the members of the Shura consultative body. However, it is not incumbent upon him to always accept the views and recommendations of the members. The Khalifatul Masi has overall authority for all religious and organizational matters and is bound to decide and act in accordance with the Quran and Sunnah. Islamic call A number of Islamist political parties and mujahideen called for the restoration of the caliphate by uniting Muslim nations, either through political action e.g., Hesput Tahir, or through force e.g., Al-Qaeda. Various Islamist movements gained momentum in recent years with the ultimate aim of establishing a caliphate. In 2014, ISIL, ISIS made a claim to re-establishing the caliphate. Those advocating the re-establishment of a caliphate differed in their methodology and approach. Some were locally oriented, mainstream political parties that had no apparent transnational objectives. Abul Ayla Mordudi believed the caliph was not just an individual ruler who had to be restored, but was man's representation of God's authority on earth. Khalafa means representative. Man, according to Islam, is the representative of people. His God's vicegerent, that is to say, by virtue of the powers delegated to him, and within the limits prescribed by the Qur'an and the teaching of the Prophet, the Caliph is required to exercise divine authority. The Muslim Brotherhood advocates pan-Islamic unity and the implementation of Islamic law. Founder Hassan al-Banna wrote about the restoration of the Caliphate, one transnational group whose ideology was based specifically on restoring the Caliphate as a pan-Islamic state is Hesput Tahir literally. Party of Liberation. It is particularly strong in Central Asia and Europe and is growing in strength in the Arab world. It is based on the claim that Muslims can prove that God exists and that the Quran is the Word of God. 
Hess put Tahir's stated strategy is a non-violent political and intellectual struggle. In Southeast Asia, groups such as Jemaah Islamiyah aimed to establish a caliphate across Indonesia, Malaysia, Brunei and parts of Thailand, the Philippines and Cambodia. <laughs> Al-Qaeda's caliphate goals Al-Qaeda has as one of its clearly stated goals the re-establishment of a caliphate. Its former leader, Osama bin Laden, called for Muslims to "...establish the righteous caliphate of our Ummah." Al-Qaeda chiefs released a statement in 2005, under which, in what they call, "...phase 5," there will be "...an Islamic state, or caliphate." Al-Qaeda has named its internet newscast from Iraq, "...the voice of the caliphate." According to author and Egyptian native Lawrence Wright, Ayman al-Zawahiri, bin Laden's mentor and al-Qaeda's second-in-command until 2011, once, "...sought to restore the caliphate which had formally ended in 1924 following the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire but which had not exercised real power since the 13th century." Zawahiri believes that once the caliphate is re-established, Egypt would become a rallying point for the rest of the Islamic world, leading the jihad against the West. Then history would make a new turn, God willing. Zawahiri later wrote, "...in the opposite direction against the empire of the United States and the world's Jewish government." Opposition. Scholar Olivier Roy writes that, "...early on, Islamists replace the concept of the caliphate with that of the emir." There were a number of reasons including, "...that according to the classical authors, a caliph must be a member of the tribe of the Prophet the Quraysh. Moreover, caliphs ruled societies that the Islamists do not consider to have been Islamic the Ottoman Empire. This is not the view of the majority of Islamist groups, as both the Muslim Brotherhood and Hesput Tahir view the Ottoman state as a caliphate. Government Electing or appointing a caliph In his book The Early Islamic Conquests 1981, Fred Donner argues that the standard Arabian practice during the early caliphates was for the prominent men of a kinship group, or tribe, to gather after a leader's death and elect a leader from amongst themselves, although there was no specified procedure for this shura, or consultative assembly. Candidates were usually from the same lineage as the deceased leader, but they were not necessarily his sons. Capable men who would lead well were preferred over an ineffectual direct heir, as there was no basis in the majority Sunni view that the head of state or governor should be chosen based on lineage alone. Since the Umayyads, all caliphates have been dynastic. Traditionally, Sunni Muslim madhabs all agreed that a caliph must be a descendant of the Quraysh. Al-Bakiyani has said that the leader of the Muslims simply should be from the majority. Topic. Sunni belief Following the death of Muhammad, a meeting took place at Saqifah. At that meeting, Abu Bakr was elected caliph by the Muslim community. Sunni Muslims developed the belief that the caliph is a temporal political ruler, appointed to rule within the bounds of Islamic law Sharia. The job of adjudicating orthodoxy and Islamic law was left to mujtahids, legal specialists collectively called the ulama. Many Muslims call the first four caliphs the Rashidun, meaning the rightly guided, because they are believed to have followed the Quran and the Sunnah example of Muhammad. Topic: <laughs> Shia belief. The Shia believe in the imamate, a principle by which rulers are imams who are divinely chosen, infallible and sinless and must come from the Ahl al-Bayt regardless of majority opinion, shura or election. They claim that before his death, Muhammad had given many indications, in the hadith of the Pond of Qum in particular, that he considered Ali, his cousin and son-in-law, as his successor. 
For the Twelvers, Ali and his eleven descendants, the Twelve Imams, are believed to have been considered, even before their birth, as the only valid Islamic rulers appointed and decreed by God. Shia Muslims believe that all the Muslim caliphs following Muhammad's death to be illegitimate due to their unjust rule and that Muslims have no obligation to follow them, as the only guidance that was left behind, as ordained in the hadith of the two weighty things, was the Islamic holy book, the Quran and Muhammad's family and offspring, who are believed to be infallible, therefore able to lead society and the Muslim community with complete justice and equity. The Prophet's own grandson, and third Shia Imam, Hussein ibn Ali led an uprising against injustice and the oppressive rule of the Muslim Caliph at the time at the Battle of Karbala. Shia Muslims emphasize that values of social justice, and speaking out against oppression and tyranny are not merely moral values, but values essential to a person's religiosity. After these twelve Imams, the potential caliphs, had passed, and in the absence of the possibility of a government headed by their Imams, some Twelvers believe it was necessary that a system of Shi'i Islamic government based on the guardianship of the Islamic jurist be developed, due to the need for some form of government, where an Islamic jurist or faqih rules Muslims, suffices. However this idea, developed by the Maja Ayatollah Rahola Khomeini and established in Iran, is not universally accepted among the Shia. Ismailis believe in the imamate principle mentioned above, but they need not be secular rulers as well. The Nazari continue to have a living imam, the current imam is the Aga Khan. The Tayyabi Ismaili have, since the year 1130, followed the imam's chief officer, the Dai al-Mutlaq, as they believe the imams are in a state of hiding. <laughs> Majlis al-Shura The Majlis al-Shura literally, consultative assembly, was a representation of the idea of consultative governance. The importance of this is premised by the following verses of the Quran. Those who answer the call of their Lord and establish the prayer, and who conduct their affairs by Shura are loved by God. 42-38 Consult them the people in their affairs. Then when you have taken a decision from them, put your trust in Allah." 3 to 159 The majlis is also the means to elect a new caliph. Al-Mawadi has written that members of the majlis should satisfy three conditions, they must be just, have enough knowledge to distinguish a good caliph from a bad one and have sufficient wisdom and judgment to select the best caliph. Al-Mawadi also said that in emergencies when there is no caliphate and no majlis, the people themselves should create a majlis and select a list of candidates for caliph, then the majlis should select a caliph from the list of candidates. Some Islamist interpretations of the role of the majlis al-Shura are the following. In an analysis of the Shura chapter of the Quran, Islamist author Sayyid Qutb argues that Islam only requires the ruler to consult with some of the representatives of the ruled and govern within the context of the Sharia. Taqiyuddin al Navani, the founder of a transnational political movement devoted to the revival of the caliphate, writes that although the Shura is an important part of the ruling structure of the Islamic caliphate, it is not one of its pillars meaning that its neglect would not make a caliph's rule UN Islamic such as to justify a rebellion. However, the Muslim Brotherhood, the largest Islamic movement in Egypt, has toned down these Islamist views by accepting in principle that in the modern age the Majlis al-Shura is democracy but during its governance of Egypt in 2013, the Muslim Brotherhood did not put that principle into practice. Accountability of rulers al Mawadi said that if the rulers meet their Islamic responsibilities to the public the people must obey their laws, but a caliph or ruler who becomes either unjust or severely ineffective must be impeached via the Majlis al-Shura. Al-Juwaini argued that Islam is the goal of the Ummah, so any ruler who deviates from this goal must be impeached. Al-Ghazali believed that oppression by a caliph is sufficient grounds for impeachment. Rather than just relying on impeachment, Ibn Haha al-Asqalani stated that the people have an obligation to rebel if the caliph begins to act with no regard for Islamic law. Ibn Haha al-Asqalani said that to ignore such a situation is haram and those who cannot revolt from inside the caliphate should launch a struggle from outside. Al-Asqalani used two ayahs from the Quran to justify this. 
and they the sinners on Kiyama will say, Our Lord. We obeyed our leaders and our chiefs, and they misled us from the right path. Our Lord. Give them the leaders double the punishment you give us and curse them with a very great curse. 33–67–68 Islamic lawyers commented that when the rulers refused to step down after being impeached through the majlis, becoming dictators through the support of a corrupt army, if the majority is in agreement they have the option to launch a revolution. Many noted that this option is to be exercised only after factoring in the potential cost of life. Topic. Rule of law The following hadith establishes the principle of rule of law in relation to nepotism and accountability. Narrated Aisha, the people of Quraysh worried about the lady from Bani Maxim who had committed theft. They asked, Who will intercede for her with Allah's apostle? Some said, No one dare to do so except Asama bin Zayed, the beloved one to Allah's apostle. When Osama spoke about that to Allah's Apostle, Allah's Apostle said, Do you try to intercede for somebody in a case connected with Allah's prescribed punishments? Then he got up and delivered a sermon saying, What destroyed the nations preceding you, was that if a noble amongst them stole, they would forgive him, and if a poor person amongst them stole, they would inflict Allah's legal punishment on him. By Allah, if Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad my daughter, stole, I would cut off her hand." Various Islamic lawyers, however, place multiple conditions and stipulations on the execution of such a law, making it difficult to implement. For example, the poor cannot be penalized for stealing out of poverty, and during a time of drought in the Rashidun Caliphate, capital punishment was suspended until the effects of the drought passed. Islamic jurists later formulated the concept that all classes were subject to the law of the land, and no person is above the law. Officials and private citizens alike have a duty to obey the same law. Furthermore, a Qadi Islamic judge was not allowed to discriminate on the grounds of religion, race, color, kinship, or prejudice. In a number of cases, caliphs had to appear before judges as they prepared to render their verdict. According to Noah Feldman, a law professor at Harvard University, the system of legal scholars and jurists responsible for the rule of law was replaced by the codification of Sharia by the Ottoman Empire in the early 19th century. Topic: <laughs> Economy. During the Muslim agricultural revolution, the caliphate understood that real incentives were needed to increase productivity and wealth and thus enhance tax revenues. A social transformation took place as a result of changing land ownership giving individuals of any gender, ethnic or religious background the right to buy, sell, mortgage and inherit land for farming or any other purpose. Signatures were required on contracts for every major financial transaction concerning agriculture, industry, commerce and employment. Copies of the contract were usually kept by both parties involved. There are similarities between Islamic economics and leftist or socialist economic policies. Islamic jurists have argued that privatization of the origin of oil, gas, and other fire producing fuels, as well as lakes, waterways, and grazing land, is forbidden. Some have even claimed that, pasture might be applied to all agricultural land, though they are in the minority. The principle of public or joint ownership has been drawn by Muslim jurists from the following hadith of Muhammad, "...the Muslims are partners in three, water, pastures and fire." Islamic jurists hold that, "...in water, pastures and fire," includes other natural resources as well, including petroleum, and they specify that, "...pastures," means land that is not privately owned, where people graze their animals. It does not include privately owned farmland, orchards, groves, etc., as it is a well-known fact that the companions of Prophet Muhammad, held privately owned orchards and farmlands in the first Islamic state at Medina. They also make exceptions in the case of processing, packaging, and selling water, as long as there is no dire need for it by the people. The legal ruling by the majority of Ulema is that water is public property, while it is still in the lake, river, etc., but when it is put into a container, it becomes the property of the owner of the vessel. According to Salah al-Fawzan, 
If a person has collected water in his vessel or in his pond, then he has taken possession of it and it is permissible for him to sell it, because he has collected it and it has come into his possession, and he has expended effort to acquire it, so it has become his property. However, if the Muslim community is in dire need of water, then it must be shared, regardless of whether it came from public waterways or a private well. Aside from similarities to socialism, early forms of proto-capitalism and free markets were present in the caliphate, since an early market economy an early form of merchant capitalism developed between the 8th and 12th centuries, which some refer to as Islamic capitalism. A vigorous monetary economy developed based on the circulation of a stable high-value currency the dinar and the integration of previously independent monetary areas. Business techniques and forms of business organization employed during this time included early contracts, bills of exchange, long-distance international trade, early forms of partnership such as limited partnerships and early forms of credit, debt, profit, loss, capital al -mal, capital accumulation nama al -mal, circulating capital, capital expenditure, revenue, checks, promissory notes, trusts startup companies, savings accounts, transactional accounts, pawning, Owning, exchange rates, bankers, money changes, ledgers, deposits, assignments, the double entry bookkeeping system, and lawsuits. Organizational enterprises similar to corporations independent from the state also existed in the medieval Islamic world. Many of these concepts were adopted and further advanced in medieval Europe from the 13th century onwards. Early Islamic law included collection of Zakat charity, one of the five pillars of Islam, since the time of the first Islamic state, established by Allah's messenger at Medina. The taxes including zakat and jiyya collected in the treasury bait al -mal of an Islamic government were used to provide income for the needy, including the poor, elderly, orphans, widows and the disabled. During the Caliphate of Abu Bakr, a number of the Arab tribes, who had accepted Islam at the hand of the Prophet Muhammad, rebelled and refused to continue to pay the zakat, leading to the Ridda Wars. Caliph Umar added to the duties of the state an allowance, paid on behalf of every man woman and child, starting at birth, creating the world's first state-run social welfare program. Maya Schatzmiller states that the demographic behavior of medieval Islamic society varied in some significant aspects from other agricultural societies. Nomadic groups within places like the deserts of Egypt and Morocco maintained high birth rates compared to rural and urban populations, though periods of extremely high nomadic birth rates seem to have occurred in occasional «surges» rather than on a continuous basis. Individuals living in large cities had much lower birth rates, possibly due to the use of birth control methods and political or economic instability. This led to population declines in some regions. While several studies have shown that Islamic scholars enjoyed a life expectancy of 59 to 75 years between the 11th and 13th centuries, the overall life expectancy of men in the same societies was lower. Factoring in infant mortality, Lawrence Conrad estimates the average lifespan in the early Islamic caliphate to be above 35 years for the general population, compared to around 40 years for the population of classical Greece and 31 years for the population of 13th century England. The early Islamic empire also had the highest literacy rates among pre modern societies, alongside the city of classical Athens in the 4th century BC, and later, China after the introduction of printing from the 10th century. One factor for the relatively high literacy rates in the early Islamic empire was its parent-driven educational marketplace, as the state did not systematically subsidize educational services until the introduction of state funding under Nizam al-Mulk in the 11th century. Another factor was the diffusion of paper from China, which led to an efflorescence of books and written culture in Islamic society, thus papermaking technology transformed Islamic society and later, the rest of Afro-Eurasia from an oral to scribal culture, comparable to the later shifts from scribal to typographic culture, and from typographic culture to the Internet. Other factors include the widespread use of paper books in Islamic society more so than any other previously existing society, the study and memorization of the Quran, flourishing commercial activity and the emergence of the Maktab and Madrasa educational institutions. <laughs> Notable caliphs Rashidun Righteously guided. 
Abu Bakr, first Rashidun Caliph. Subdued rebel tribes in the Ridda Wars. Umar, Umar ibn al-Khattab, second Rashidun Caliph. During his reign, the Islamic Empire expanded to include Egypt, Jerusalem and Persia. Uthman ibn Affan, third Rashidun Caliph. The various written copies of the Quran were standardized under his direction. Killed by rebels. Ali, Ali ibn Abu Talib, fourth Rashidun Caliph. Considered by Shia Muslims however to be the first Imam. His reign was fraught with internal conflict, with Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan Muawiyah the first and Amr ibn Allahs controlling the Levant and Egypt regions independently of Ali. Hassan ibn Ali, fifth caliph. Considered as rightly guided by several historians. He abdicated his right to the caliphate in favor of Muawiyah I in order to end the potential for ruinous civil war. Muawiyah I, first caliph of the Umayyad dynasty. Muawiyah instituted dynastic rule by appointing his son Yazid I as his successor, a trend that would continue through subsequent caliphates. Umar ibn Abd al-Aziz Umar II, Umayyad caliph who is considered one of the finest rulers in Muslim history. He is also considered by some mainly Sunnis to be among the rightly guided caliphs. Harun al-Rashid, Abbasid caliph during whose reign Baghdad became the world's prominent center of trade, learning and culture. Harun is the subject of many stories in the famous 1001 Nights. al mamun a great Abbasid patron of Islamic philosophy and science, Suleiman the Magnificent, an Ottoman caliph during whose reign the Ottoman Empire reached its zenith Abdul Hamid II, last Ottoman caliph to rule with independent, absolute power Abdumsid II, last caliph of the Ottoman dynasty. Nominally the 37th head of the Ottoman dynasty. See also Al-Mahajarun Emirate Khanate List of transcontinental countries Shah Sheikh al-Islam Worldwide Caliphate <laughs>